Sprinklers. <laughs> I was going to call the meeting. I was going to call the meeting to order, but we don't have a quorum unless they're hiding someplace in the wings. Well, here they come. Okay. So I think two, four, two, four, six. Uh, I think we're good to get going. So this is the first of public meetings uh, for the 2019 uh, Regional Operating Capital Budget. Uh, notice has been given uh, publicly for this meeting here tonight. We'll have another public input session in early February. No decisions will be made this evening. Final decisions on the budget will be made at the February 19th uh, budget meeting. I'd also like to encourage people to go onto our website for those who are watching live via the web to go to our um, website and input and provide input into the budget. Just go to regionalwaterloo.ca and there is an opportunity there to provide comments on our operating budget. Okay, so with that, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Councillor Kiefer? Hang on. Yes, I, uh, I have to declare on the uh, Social Planning Council. My son's the president, so I declared the last time, and I'm declaring again this time. Thank you. Okay, so I had the Social Planning Council as being cancelled. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see Lynn in the audience. Okay. But so your conflict is so noted, uh, Councillor Kiefer, thank you. Any other conflicts? Seeing none, okay, thank you. All right, so our first delegation is Sharon Livingstone, Cambridge Council on Aging. Welcome, Sharon. This is just a bit confusing, and Carl is quite right. This uh, agency is Solutions to Poverty for Waterloo Region. The Social Planning Council is the backbone organization to Solutions to Poverty. So the background to this proposal is that we are an aging society. That should come as no surprise to anyone in this room. By 2031, one in five residents of the region will be over the age of 65. Many older adults do not retire. In today's world, they continue to work. They continue to take courses through community colleges and universities. They volunteer. They take public transit to get around. One of the barriers to using public transit is accessing and using a complicated system, which will be more complicated with the introduction of the ION. I want to give you a really personal example of the difficulty. The Social Planning Council received a phone call from a resident of Cambridge describing her mobility issues and challenges. She had been taking taxis and getting rides from family and friends and using Mobility Plus to meet her transportation needs. But due to issues of affordability, and I will point out that there is a significant number of people living in poverty who are older adults, she wanted to learn to take public transit. It was not a good experience. During the first bus ride, she couldn't figure out how to secure her walker, encountered great difficulties with navigating the bus with her walker, and when the bus eventually turned a corner, the walker went flying down the front of the bus. She was most discouraged and most upset. The number of older adults is projected to increase affordable public transit will help to address issues of poverty, the environmental impact, and social isolation and inclusion. There are many examples of transportation programming for older adults in other municip municipalities across Ontario. Waterloo Region appears to be behind. We are introducing a proposal called Ride a Bus Program. This has been a highly successful program in Hamilton and Brant. It pre presents an opportunity and investment for the region to increase GRT and ION ridership in alignment with the transportation master plan goals. There is a local need for ride-a-bus programming. A Waterloo feasibility report showed that older adults have transportation needs for recreation. When the Cambridge Council on Aging did our work around age friendly, we discovered that older adults really needed to ride the bus at least one day a week to do shopping and go to appointments. 
The Elmira Community Living has found they had a thousand hits on the free pilot run by the Kiwanis that links around Elmira. And in October 2018, that began it, and it has had a greater than anticipated use, but it isn't to link people to employment. It's to link people to their friends, to getting groceries, to doing, going to the library and doing inclusive things. The City of Kitchener consultations identified that Mobility Plus has been challenging and isn't keeping up with the demand. The top priorities identified from the community were transit routes and stops 35 percent, transit fares 21.6 percent, and accessibility 16.6 percent. Ride a bus programming has been offered successfully in Brantford, there's a council resolution that approves the ride a bus programming for twice a year for the last five years. A few years ago, the region of Waterloo provided the similar program for Syrian refugees. Okay, our ask. What we would like you to do is approve two free city buses for Kitchener, Waterloo, and Cambridge in mid to late April and late August of 2019, five to six times a year in total. We're suggesting the spring, since apparently ridership is typically slow then because students are on break from study, and it's particularly just before the launch of the ION. It could be a great time to familiarize older adults with riding the bus and ION transfers. Grand River Transit would be responsible for providing the education and guiding older adults in the ride a bus program. Education will address accessibility and safety features and how to get to common destinations of interest, how to buy fares, how to transfer. Typically, it would run for half a day or two to 2.5 hours. We'll have in-class instruction, instruction about how to use the easy go cards, which will soon replace bus tickets. For people like me who haven't ridden a bus in 40 years, this would be really helpful. Poverty among older adults is on the rise. Social isolation is a public health issue. Offering this program and affordable transportation would help to address those issues. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Sharon. Are there any questions for the delegation? Oh, we have a couple here. Um, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, not not uh, a question. I. I, I have had the opportunity to uh, learn about this 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 plan. Um, really, just uh, an endorsement of it. I think it's an excellent idea. I think it, it would be extremely helpful. I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of people who don't use the bus about why they don't use the bus, and it's not just seniors I'm talking to. It's a very daunting thing if you haven't done it. How to use the card once you get on the bus? You know, how, how do you know when your next stop is? How do you get off the bus? Do you push the door? Do you wave your hand? You know, it, it, there's there's it, it's it's uh, quite intimidating for people, so I think that uh, we, we need to not underestimate that factor, thank make you. it easier for people. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor McGarry. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Sharon, for your always very thoughtful and detailed presentation. I don't think that anyone understands the level of detail until uh, they've actually gone through some of these programs, and I always appreciate your comments on those fine details. Um, my comments actually echo uh, Councillor Clark's in looking at not just potentially offering a, a, a training session for seniors, but potentially opening up to other members of the community, new Canadians that may not read or understand English, to understand some of the signs on, on the transit system and how to use it. And I'm, I may have missed it, but um, did you have any suggestions on who would offer this program? It would be offered in, by the GRT. They already offer uh, bus training and in, and we're suggesting this be a group bus train. Um, the Council on Aging, my friends at, in Kitchener and Waterloo who do age-friendly work would help to get the word out. And um, it would be offered, and I agree with you, it could be offered if we look at age-friendly, which is for folks from three months to 103, it would also be useful for moms who are struggling with strollers and little kids. Agreed, thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Murray? 
Um, yeah, I, I'd actually like, uh, I'd ask uh, uh, Mr. Schmidt to comment on this. This, this is actually something that GRT does. They, they have this bus training program, and I think that uh, there was what um, Sharon's asking for. I actually think it's something that probably can be accommodated, but I'll ask Thomas to comment. Mr. Schmidt? Absolutely. We do have a, a program where we do help uh, new uh, new riders of our system and staff have heard this request in I believe late December it, w it was raised and we've looked at it and we could accommodate that within our budget and would be willing to work with with this group to put that together Great. okay Thank so you. there's some good news for you Thank you so very much <laughs> <Yeah. Happy New laughs> <Year. laughs> right. so I, I guess um, just to make sure we connect the the dots here so uh, Thomas, someone from staff will follow up with Sharon and her group. Yes, I'll get someone, uh, probably Sandy Roberts from GRT to follow up. Okay, so you'll probably get a call or an email from Deb Roberts. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, the next is uh, Tova Davidson, Sustainable Waterloo Region, and Dr. Paul Silvini. How'd I do with those names? I do okay? <laughs> All right. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here today. I'm Tova Davidson, and this is Paul Salvini, and we are co-presenting um, to support a budget request that has gone in for the Evolve Green Space. I'm going to tell you a bit about the story of what this um, is that we're asking you to support, and hopefully answer any questions that you have. Where'd the slides go? We need those. Wonderful. Mm -mm -mm. Awesome. So, a little bit of background for you about who Sustainable Waterloo Region is. Most of you have seen me standing here year after year talking to you about who we are and what we do. So I'm going to do that really, really quickly. We are a social enterprise not-for-profit and we work in the area of um, economic development and sustainability. How do we support the creation of a clean economy here in Waterloo Region? We have a whole bunch of different programs that we run. There's some great impacts that we have. Um, in the past, we are now 10 years old. Um, and we actually manage over a million tons of greenhouse gases in this community. I'm actually very excited to say that as of um, December 31st last year, every single area municipality is participating in the Regional Sustainability Initiative. That was a massive woo-woo in my world. Um, so very excited. So all of you are active and participating in this, and thank you for your support over the years. What I'm going to start talking to you about a bit is Evolve One. So just to give you the background of how this happened and what's going on. In 2013, Sustainable Waterloo Region did a new strategic plan. And in that strategic plan, we went out to the community and asked them, what did they think was the next piece that we needed to conquer to create that clean economy? And this is all about economic development and clean economy. And what we heard was that they wanted us to create a center for sustainability excellence, or as they called it, a home for business and sustainability here in Waterloo Region. We did a business case, put out a call for land, and to our surprise, we had four organizations that came to us and said they wanted to work in partnership on this project. Um, and then we selected partners. The partners that we selected for this project, and this was in 2014, was the Cora Group, and they are the developer, and they own and manage the resulting building. The landowner, the David Johnson Research and Tech Park, and they have come together, they came together to talk to us. And then EY Canada as the anchor tenant, and they were already a great partner of Sustainable Waterloo Region. And then together, those four organizations, and some of you have heard this, had um, meetings, actually, every three weeks for four years to make this project come to fruition. What the project was is called Evolve One. And I'm so excited to tell you that it is actually the first of its kind building in all of Canada. 
It is a multi-tenant office building, 110,000 square feet, and it is net positive energy. This has never been done in Canada before. It generates more energy than it uses, modeled to 108% of the energy needs. And just as a little tease, we found out recently that the solar wall, which is just one portion of one wall of the building, was enough to heat the entire building in December for a day. They shut down the heating system. How cool is that? And the extra cool part of it is that it's completely done within the developer's approved budget. So it's scalable and replicable. These buildings could be built across the country and it is within the developer's approved budget. No funding to this project. Super cool and it's a game changer and we're really excited about it. If people have questions about the building, I would love to do it, it's so exciting. We can talk about it later. <laughs> Okay, so this is what the, um, the photo of what it looked like. It pretty much looks like this. Um, it is um, at, at West Graham Way. If anyone hasn't been there, you need to email me. We would love to show you around. Very cool building. And it's a no compromise building. If anything, it's a high standard of office building. It doesn't look like sustainability needs compromise. It looks like sustainability is ultra cool. But there's a bigger challenge that we also wanted to conquer in this project right from the strategic planning phase in 2013. And that is the problem of Canada losing ground in the clean economy. I don't know if everyone knows, but the clean economy is a $3 trillion industry worldwide. Canada is losing ground. There is a massive opportunity for economic development in this region if we can leverage that sector and diversify our economy in a way that builds the clean economy and makes us a stronger economy in the long run. And that is what we are doing in the Evolve Green. And that's what I'm here to ask you to help support. Evolve Green is a collaboration between Sustainable Waterloo Region and our partners, including the Accelerator Centre, the University of Waterloo, and Wilfrid Laurier University. And together, we are working on how do we build that clean economy. Um, I'll let Paul talk about the work at the Accelerator Centre. The universities have um, IC3, which is the International Consortium on Climate Change there. The Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy is there. And we have moved our offices there so that together we are actually collaborating and working on ways to how do we foster this new economy with existing businesses, etc. These are a couple of pictures of the Evolve Green. We're still finishing some of the fit out, but I wandered around yesterday with my phone and took some pictures. Um, it is a collaborative space. So we are, um, we have the kitchen where everybody comes together and works together. There are offices that are shared. We have a smaller footprint because our meeting rooms are shared. Everyone doesn't have their own meeting rooms. And the idea is that we come together to work on the challenge of how do we clean this economy and make us stronger. On the ground floor of the Evolve One building, this is the space all outlined in green, appropriately, um, and it is off the atrium. So when you come in, the three doors that you see off the atrium are all the Evolve Green, those four partners together. The things we do, collaboration, cutting edge research, lots and lots of leadership, commercialization of ideas, innovation, social impact, inspiring change, and we've been able to work with a lot of the area municipalities on these kinds of things in the past. The intention is that this accelerates the kind of impact that we can have. I'm going to now pass it over to Paul to talk about the uh, role that the Accelerator Centre is playing. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thrilled to be here today. and. I want to talk about the, uh, the, the Clean Tech Innovation Hub, which is the second themed incubator that we're opening up. The first incubator that was uh, the, created was the Accelerator Center itself, which 13 years ago, thanks to funding from, uh, from this very council, uh, was able to be created. We created then themed incubators recently, one in downtown Kitchener called the Hardware Innovation Lab, and the second one being the TD Sustainable Future Lab. The idea of a themed incubator is to have a place where we can provide not just general business advice, but specific advice linked to, in this case, the clean economy with specialist mentors uh, and uh, different kinds of programming that's, uh, that's customized for those companies. The Accelerator itself, uh, Accelerator Center itself, has enjoyed tremendous success since being created 13 years ago. Since we've been graduating companies, we've had 59 companies graduate from the whole program, uh, even though uh, we've worked at various phases with over 300 companies. 
Those graduates have a 93% success rate of still being in business two years after they graduate, which is significantly higher than the industry average. 89% of those companies are remaining in Waterloo Region, and that small investment has resulted in about $2.5 billion in corporate value being generated locally, 2,200 jobs, and over 750 co-op placements. So we're pretty pleased with, uh, with that success. This year we were uh, granted two beautiful awards. Uh, one was number one incubator and accelerator in Canada, and the second was the number four incubator and accelerator in the world by UBI Global. So I think Waterloo Region has some reasons to be extraordinarily proud of the investment that you made a number of years ago in terms of what we've been able to achieve together. That specialized programming I talked about is putting people into what is now a living lab, a building that they can actually run tests in, create new devices, speak to other people that are passionate and, and engaged, bring in investors who are interested in the clean economy, have access to different kinds of events, and, and access to research labs as well. We started that programming uh, at the Accelerator Center itself. We incubated 10 companies over the past uh, year, and with help from the Ontario Trillium Foundation to support programming over the next three years, we also brought in the corporate client TD with a $1 million donation to the program. Uh, it's a phenomenal facility and, and an amazing program that we're quite excited about. We expect that we will be creating 100 jobs in the next three years with a value of over $250 million for the economy. We've secured a number of funds to date. What we're asking this council for is, uh, uh, well, we'd love 310,000 to match what the city of uh, Waterloo was providing, but, uh, but uh, $200,000 to support the fit out of this facility to close that final gap to allow us to uh, uh, continue with our programming. And uh, that's the ask and I'll turn it back over to Tova. Awesome. So you can see that this space, the Evolve Green, has brought together in this recognized first of its kind building and recognized by the Canadian Green Building Council, not just by like everyone knows, but true recognition and awards in this incredible space, the opportunity for not only the creation of a demonstration site of what is possible in terms of green buildings, but in creating new businesses in a whole giant sector that is just screaming for Canada to take leadership, to take... Uh, the work that Sustainable Waterloo Region has done and elevate it and help it to accelerate, to use that apropos word, and to take the research that's happening at our two local universities and to bring them all together to really change the economy, to create jobs, to support small business, and to encourage culture change and how are we seeing ourselves as a region, that we are a clean economy region. So thank you for considering this. Thank you for um, all the support that this council and all of your councils have given to us over the years to both of our organizations, and we're really excited to continue working with you on all of this. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thanks, both of you, for, for an excellent presentation. <laughs> I just wanted to confirm that the ask is $50,000 a year for four years, so a total of $200,000 over four years. Okay. Uh, we have a couple questions. Chair Redmond. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's great to see you as always, and it's so exciting. Congratulations on your awards. Um, I have a question, and then I, I'm going to um, lean on your expertise, hopefully. Um, what do you think keeps those um, emerging high-tech, uh, innovative companies in Waterloo Region? I think it's, it's a few things. Uh... What keeps them is the ecosystem here, the support that we provide, the access to talent that emerges from the universities. That complete ecosystem, really there's, there's no reason to leave in terms of this being the company's home. What we have seen, though, is, is almost all of these companies are, with our motto, built to scale, in that they almost always are opening up other offices around the world, but keeping their home here in Waterloo Region. So I think that's the reason, is the support that's being provided uh, um, gives them no reason to want to leave, and access to, uh, to talent, which is the number one thing for a fast-growing business, is what keeps them here. I think the other thing I'll, I'll mention is not only does it keep those businesses here, but it keeps the students that are graduating here because access to amazing opportunities and a chance to work on exciting, meaningful, 
global problems and, and being connected to a fast-growing startup company, that's what our graduates are looking for. So not only do we have an ecosystem that's creating and, and keeping companies in town, but it's creating and, and, and keeping some of our top talent in town, some of that talent that we attracted from around the world. And as a regional council, we are committed to, to being green, and we have made our commitment to reducing 80% by 2050. And one of the things, and uh, Councillor Jaworski and I were talking about this, that we're looking at as we go forward in the budget process, the actually procurement of buses. And I'm just wondering if you have any view of electric buses. It's something that we're keen, keen to see in innovation as we look down the road. And... Uh, one of the things that I think about, too, is the installation of the infrastructure for charging. And I'm just wondering if you would comment positively so we would have more more tools in our arsenal. Absolutely. Um, I would never comment on anything but positively when it comes to electric vehicles. We know from the Climate Action Program, which is one of the places that Sustainable Waterloo Region works, that 49% of the carbon footprint in Waterloo Region comes from transportation. So getting people on mass transit is a really important piece of it, and cleaning that transit is an also really important piece. We at Sustainable Waterloo Region like to call the ION the biggest electric carpool ever. Uh, so we're super excited for it to start and get all that carpooling, as we like to call it, happening. Um, in terms of electric buses, yes, I've seen really interesting case studies of uh, communities that have brought in those buses and the ability to do that. Uh, it can make a massive change in terms of that um, fleet to be able to change over into electric buses and that they are able to charge in many ways if you have the high-level charging stations to charge very, very quickly. Um, and so that kind of infrastructure would be required for buses specifically. I can tell you that uh, electric personal vehicles, there's over 100 um, publicly available charging stations, I believe, in Waterloo Region now. Um, and we have now, actually, as of June 2018, we have over 1,000 electric vehicles registered in Waterloo Region, and the goal was to do that by 2020. So adoption of that technology is happening very quickly, and the uh, reliability of it is <coughs> very good. Thank you very much. Okay, I have uh, Councillor Bravanovic and then Jaworski. Thank you, and I, I too wanted to uh, thank uh, both of you for uh, uh, your leadership, particularly in, in this area, but in a variety of other things uh, in, in, in the community as well. Just, uh, you know, you, you referenced um, how Canada has fallen behind, um, which surprises me to a certain degree, um, particularly with some of the emphasis that um, certainly until recently has been put both at the provincial and the federal level um, around uh, climate change and, and, and clean tech. Any sense of what's what's driving that? And um, maybe if you can just touch on a little bit more on how you see this will at least make sure that our region is helping turn that around. So um, I, uh, it's very interesting that there is a Canadian uh, cultural perspective, an introspective perspective, that we are environmentally sustainable. Um, we have the highest emissions per capita in the... Um, in the 20 largest countries in the world. We are absolutely environmentally bad. Uh, but we think because we have all these trees and all of these lakes that we are doing really, really well, and the world actually thinks that as well. So they have this vision of Canada as a very clean and green um, community culture, et cetera. Um, and so I think there's a little bit of... Um, a challenge for the perception of who we are and how we operate. Um, I also, and I would ask Paul if this is true, I'm not sure that there is another clean tech incubator like this. Oh, pardon me? It's the only one I know of. The only one we know of in Canada. So that would be a really cool thing to be able to say that the first one of those was here. Um, to be able to actually focus on that. So that's one of the things that there is no specialty support at this point. Just like the Regional Sustainability Initiative has scaled, just like this building has been designed to scale, everything we're doing here is being designed to create impact um, that could potentially go beyond our borders. The, the other thing that I guess would be of interest to me, uh, well, two things. One, um, what kind of support either through for this initiative um, or for um, Evolve, uh, one has, has come from either the provincial or federal governments, either directly or indirectly through things like FCM and so on. Sure. 
So yeah. there was um, funding support for the feasibility study for the Evolve One building from FCM, and that was done in partnership with the City of Waterloo. Um, and that actually is a really cool document, which is, I'm so proud to say, live and online. Anybody can go and find out exactly how to replicate this building. It's not the exact technical specs for this building, but how do you replicate this? That is online. For the building itself, there was no federal or provincial funding for the building. And that was actually done purposefully. We know that the development industry, um, if they saw that there was a whole bunch of money that had been put in by the government, might not actually see this as a replicable model. So it is done completely within the developer's budget. And they see a good business case, a good enough business case, that he's marketing Evolve 2 across the street. So this is a good business decision. The Evolve Green has had some support from groups like Paul talked about, like the Trillium Foundation, to try to get this group off the ground, because we are a group of four not-for-profits, with universities, Accelerator Center, and SWR. So there's been some support there, but Fair. otherwise not. Fantastic, and I'm actually pleased in a way to, to hear that you've taken that approach because I think it really is important to get the development industry to to realize that, you know what, going green doesn't have to be um, something that isn't achievable and still make their business models work. Um, the, the last point, I guess, is on the, the, the involvement of the private sector. So, I mean, you, you pointed out TD as an example. Is there sort of great interest in this from the, the, the broader private sector, and, and how do you see that evolving over the next while? Yeah, I, I think there is. I think, uh, I think the private sector is, uh, is realizing they have a role to play in terms of sustainability. I think a lot of companies have, have wondered what that role is. You know, many have their own initiatives, but I think also some are recognizing the opportunity to leverage the strength we have in regions like Waterloo, where they see technology impacting every sector of the economy. I think uh, some companies have realized that uh, with a small investment, there's a great opportunity for us to have an enormous impact on, on climate change and sustainability in the environment by supporting companies that are taking their knowledge of uh, of technology or uh, whatever they've they've studied and applying that to a problem that matters globally and, and a problem that matters here. And, and I'll just go back to a quick answer to the other, the other question, the first question you answered, asked was, you know, what, what the students are really looking for is how they can have a significant impact by tackling more important problems. So when you're trying to decide what you're going to study and what business you might create and run, the easier we make it for, for our graduates to tackle problems that matter for our society or for industry, uh, the more impact we're going to see from the, the results of those efforts. And so I think these are important because we're making it easier for people to tackle big problems and problems that matter by giving them access to experts, giving them access to data, giving them access to facilities and labs and things like that. So I, I think that just that ties into the piece of what we can do and, and why there's so much interest in, uh, in investing at, at this phase of, uh, of the clean tech economy. And consequently, I guess, you know, it, it's going to help us keep that talent here in, in Waterloo Region in Ontario as opposed to perhaps going to Vancouver and B.C., which is sort of seen as one of the places you'd automatically go to if you're interested in this in this field. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you to uh, both of you for coming forward. I think uh, between the Accelerator Center and, and the work that you, you know, you're doing in this partnership around this, and I see Avi's going to be speaking in a little while from Communitech. I mean, you uh, collectively, I think we've done some great things in terms of creating these economic clusters throughout our region, and, and it's important that we continue to push that envelope and, and uh, help this, uh, this region continue to push above our weight provincially and nationally. Okay, thank you, Councillor Vanovic. Councillor Jaworski. Well, uh, through the chair, I think you can really see the uh, benefit of our initial investment in the Accelerator Centre four years ago, $200,000, which generated well over 100 companies for uh, for our community. Uh, second would be the uh, new investment in Evolve Green, which will pay dividends for, for many years to come for all levels of government. Um, but I really need to see it to believe it. And I know, remember, I see my calendar, the Evolve Green grand opening is coming up. There will be the opportunity, I'm not sure if a note has gone around to all of council, but uh, maybe you could tell us a bit about the two to four, what will happen uh, during that time? 
Sure. So uh, we're doing, there has been a grand opening of the Evolve One building. We are now doing an opening of the Evolve Green building. So it's the opportunity for people, or the Evolve Green portion of the building. It's the opportunity for people to come in and actually see this build, see this space, to see how do we work together. For example, when you walk through the sustainable Waterloo region space, you seamlessly move into the Laurier space. You have no idea that there's any difference. We are completely working together. Um, so come in, see the space, um, hear about what's happening, hear a little bit about the vision and the work that we're doing, um, lots of networking. It's a great opportunity to talk to people who are also interested in the clean economy. Uh, we're unveiling a, a sponsor recognition wall, um, and you get to see the amazing space and all the great stuff that we're doing there. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, no. I'm sorry. I, I just want to say, oh. I drove by pretty early this morning on my way to work, and people were in there working away. So, uh, uh -huh. I mean, the, the current state is there are people moved in and working in the space, yes. and we're going to hold a grand opening soon. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we can see that your enthusiasm is infectious, so um, thanks so much for, for coming in and sharing with us this exciting project. Uh, in terms of committee's benefit, uh, the PowerPoint that you saw tonight, Clerks does have that, and they will uh, send that to us electronically. Uh, we'll make a final decision on February 19th with respect to your request. Great. All right, thank, thank you, so you very much. much for coming in. Thanks. Okay, Mike Booz, Tri-City Transit. Transport Action Group, TriTag. Mike, how are you? Good, and yourself? Good, good, thanks. Nice to see you. Thanks for... Uh, you have no no children in tow this evening? No, um, no, we're trying to get them in bed for seven, but that's a bit <laughs> of a um, lost cause, I think. But uh, um, my, is it just the next button and... yeah. All right, thank you. Good evening, Chair Strickland, members of Council. I'm here to present uh, tonight on behalf of the Tri-Cities Transport Action Group. Uh, TriTag uh, advocates for improved walking, wheeling, cycling, and transit across Waterloo Region because we believe that unlocking these forms of transportation leads to a better quality of life for everyone, whether in terms of health, a cleaner environment, more stable climate, and a more uh, sus equitable and robust economy. We're pleased tonight to uh, comment on the 2019 regional budget. We think there's lots in it to celebrate, as well as some areas where we think we could be making some better investments. Uh, first, we'd like to highlight the budget paper for an active transportation planning engineer position. This is huge. We've been uh, waiting for something like this for years. Someone who can help envision and implement the big picture for active transportation in this region is long overdue. We're greatly encouraged by the mandate the budget paper sets for this position for coordinating a cycling network with the area municipalities, and we look forward to working with this individual once she's hired. We'd like to stress the importance of thinking of cycling in terms of a network. Anyone viewing our current transportation master plan would wonder whether the region views cycling infrastructure as sort of an accessory to roads. The delayed uh, segregated cycling pilot in Waterloo is a step in the right direction, and we're very excited to see it go forward this year. But we need more projects like this to grow the network and bring its benefits to more centres and neighbourhoods to have a cycling network that is coherent, connected and usable by people of all ages and walks of life. In terms of the investment we're making in cycling, we worked with Cycle Waterloo Region to determine how other Canadian cities were investing in cycling. Based on what we found, we'd recommend that the region invest about $13 per resident per year in cycling infrastructure. Many of you, uh, during, our, uh, uh, during the election, uh, Cycle WR put out their uh, pledge. We had our survey uh, indicated uh, that uh, this was a target worth uh, uh, pursuing. Uh, at least in principle, uh, and uh, oh, where am I? Uh, unfortunately, the region's capital forecast shows that we're falling uh, far short of this target over the next decade, and so we're encouraging that in the coming years uh, we seek to rectify this shortfall and redouble our uh, investments in cycling uh, throughout the region. Moving to transit, Ion is coming, right? I think, I think everyone here is invested in seeing it succeed. Um, at TriTag, we've been looking at the factors that make 
uh, transit a success. Uh, and um, these factors include frequency, reliability, rapidness, and affordability. And we wanted to look at uh, what's in the budget uh, for these areas. First, for Cambridge, we're very excited uh, to see the improvements uh, coming there, especially with the 206 uh, I-Express route on Coronation Avenue. Um, one of the uh, shortcomings of uh, the 200 I-Express route and consequently uh, Stage 1 Ion bus route is that Preston gets bypassed by, uh, by uh, our rapid transit system at the moment. And so the 206 I Express, I think, will help to uh, to rectify this this gap, uh, and and help uh, as well uh, build ridership and demonstrate the need for for rapid transit in Preston and throughout Cambridge. Uh, the Conestoga College uh, U Pass uh, is is another thing we're encouraged to see. Uh, we see this as a real investment in the the future of transit ridership in Waterloo Region. Um, there are two times, uh, or two sorts of times, uh, where uh, we can have the greatest impact on someone's choice to take transit. Uh, the first is when someone is young, uh, exposure to good transit and, and um, use of, of good transit uh, leads to uh, increased use of transit later on in life. And secondly, when someone is going through a major life change. So I know Conestoga College uh, has a lot of programs for people looking for new careers or to upgrade their skills. This is the perfect time to introduce people to transit and to uh, get them on board. And I think uh, we'll see a lot of uh, modal shift as a result of this, uh, of the uh, bus route improvements and of uh, encouraging uh, students to be able to take transit. I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about fares. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, over the last dozen or so years, we've seen fares increase by about uh, 50%, even after we've taken inflation into account. And consequently, one of, it's been one of the reasons why we've seen transit ridership decline a bit a few years ago. And now that fares have frozen, uh, ridership's coming back up. Um, in the budget, in a footnote, we found a note about uh, a fare increase of, of 3% being projected this year. Um, TriTag would like to propose a fare policy uh, whereby the f annual fare increase does not exceed the annual property tax increase. We think this is fair. It's not putting a greater burden on transit ridership than anyone else. And I think uh, we put this question in our uh, 2018 election survey, and I would say a majority of you around the horseshoe, I think, see this as a, as a, as a fair sort of policy as well. Uh, and so we're hope, hoping that uh, whatever, however the numbers land uh, uh, in uh, February, uh, that uh, we're not putting uh, more of a burden on, on the transit ridership than we are on everyone else. Finally, we're very excited by uh, what's in the uh, capital forecast for GRT and for rapid transit. Um, there's, uh, you know, we're see in the coming years we're going to be investing in more trains. Uh, we'll be um, expanding uh, our, our bus network, and we're also going to be investing in articulated buses. And one of the things that really slows articulated buses down is how many people they hold, because all of those people have to get on the bus and pay a fare. And that introduces a lot of delay and a lot of unreliability uh, in transit. And it makes transit more expensive to operate. It makes it less attractive to ride. It's, it's ironic that transit becomes a victim of its own success. And so one of the ways we can deal with that is through um, off-board fare payment. Um, we're using it for uh, ION. Nobody uh, pays as they're getting on the train. They pay at the station. The train arrives, and they just step on. We can do the same thing for buses. And uh, at our, our busiest uh, transit stops and b busiest bus routes, we can implement this and uh, ensure that, uh, along with uh, other transit priority measures, that uh, people continue to move quickly with buses, even as ridership grows. And so we're very excited about what's happening uh, in uh, Waterloo uh, region over the next few years. And uh, looking, we're looking forward to uh, working with all of you over the coming term to make uh, transportation better here. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Mike. We have um, several questions. Councillor Kiefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's more of a comment than it is a question, but uh, thank you, Michael, for your presentation. And uh, thanks for bringing up the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we, we might need some uh, transportation through the uh, Preston area. I, I, I know as we speak that the uh, GRT people, the tr staff, are looking at uh, looking at all different types of, of uh, routes to, to redo some of them, and I think Preston is on that map. Um, the other thing I wanted, I didn't, <laughs> didn't mean to correct you, but it's, it's Coronation Boulevard, not Avenue. Oh, thanks. There you go. I should have known this. I used to bike on coronation every day for <laughs> four months. <laughs> oh, you got coronation right. I think that's the important part, isn't it? All right. Yeah. Councillor Galloway. Well, isn't it Coronation Street on TV? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that Councillor Keefer's favorite show. To? Right? I thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, th thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mike, thanks again for your presentation and uh, and your uh, thoughtful con uh, comments. Um, I don't really have a question, but I just, just wanted to inform you and maybe the others as well that just about an hour and a half ago when we were in our uh, budget meeting, uh, you may or may not have been watching uh, online, but uh, we talked about, uh, we've asked staff to uh, pull all active transportation items within the budget and 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 put it all together in one place. Um, and this is the, the beginning, I think, of a, a process where we're going to identify active transportation as a is, is as an actual item, so it's not just an add-on for transportation uh, projects, but will be identified as such. And when we do our strategic planning starting next month, I believe um, active transportation, I'm sure, will be a, um, a major area of emphasis. So after the meeting, staff did talk to me quickly and uh, indicated uh, how much how many millions of dollars we actually have in the budget for uh, active transportation, including uh, cycling infrastructure and uh, and uh, multiple use trails and uh, sidewalk uh, infill uh, situations where they uh, currently are disconnected, and it's it's pretty considerable. And uh, they're going to be putting that together. So uh, I know it's been difficult to go through the budget and pull out. Uh, all the various pieces. Uh, so staff uh, say they actually have that and it shouldn't be too difficult to put together and uh, you'll be able to see that shortly. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and just um, further to that, we did have an issue paper or uh, an information paper today at Budget Committee and in there it indicated for cycling infrastructure, 10-year capital plan right now has approximately $50 million in it. Yes, that's... Uh, I, I, I believe that's where uh, we got the uh, eight to nine dollar uh, per resident per year figure from, averaged over the next decade. Okay, great. Councillor McGarry, thank you very much for a very thoughtful presentation. And some of my points have already been uh, discussed with the further councillors, but or the other councillors. But I really wanted again to commend you about really promoting active transportation and what that that yields in terms of benefits to uh, individuals as well as municipalities. And I would offer that as we're looking forward at a, mas a master plan for this transportation over the next few years, that all the components of a cycling in our community are being looked at, including winter maintenance and, and how we're making sure that the network is connected between the communities. And I would also offer that having $50 million identified in a budget over 10 years for cycling infrastructure is incredible. Over um, a few years back when there were still municipalities throughout province that didn't think cyclists should even be on the road. So we've come a long way. I think the uh, suggestion that you had about the bottleneck that happens with fares and, and fare collection as a large group of citizens are getting on the buses is of, of concern in trying to keep things moving. So I just wanted to thank you again for your advocacy for a very important subject. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor McGarry. We have uh, Rubanovic and then Chair Redmond. Councillor Rubanovic. 
Thank you, and thanks uh, for the work that you and uh, uh, Cycle Waterloo Region and so many others are doing on on the active transportation um, file. I think it's uh, it's so important. Um, you know, just building on the the point that Councillor Galloway made in terms of the the dollars that we're we're putting together, um, and, and I do believe that some additional dollars will need to be found and 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 can be found. But is it Part of your belief or your organization's belief that, in fact, it maybe isn't purely an issue of um, new dollars being required, but in fact, maybe reprioritizing some of our existing dollars in terms of tackling these issues? I think both are needed. Um, it, the, uh, um, the way uh, our uh, transportation master plan uh, lays out cycling infrastructure. Um, there are a few um, sort of gap filling projects, but the bulk of the, the money is going into um, uh, projects as they are being um, roads that are already being built or, or uh, rebuilt. Um, and so you end up with um, your network being built out at whatever schedule the road network is being um, improved or, or uh, uh, maintained. Um, and that doesn't necessarily jive with, with a, a network that gets you from A to B. Um, so I, I, and I think, you know, there, there is merit to that approach in that you are, uh, you know, saving some money by not uh, digging up a road more than often than you have to or, or having to uh, um, acquire property twice and, and various, uh, you know, the coordination of, of efforts is good. Uh, but certainly being able to uh, identify a network that will carry um, a, a broad number of people um, it, to where they need to go um, rather than it simply happens to be convenient where we're building uh, a bike lane right now in terms of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the fact that we're digging the road up already. Um, I, I think that kind of prioritization will give us more bang for our buck. Okay, thank you. And the, the last question is, as we talk about this notion of a minimum protected grid from the work that you and others have done, um, while the, the, the lower tier municipalities obviously, um, you know, can try to drive this and um, in, in their own case, um, this isn't achievable without the connectivity of regional roads. So the region needs to be very much an, a, a key part of this because, I mean, we're talking about a minimum grid that isn't just for recreation purposes, but in fact is used for commuting purposes and so on. Uh, absolutely. The uh, um, most of the uh, so to get anywhere, you you generally will need to cross probably at least one regional road in in. A given trip unless it's you're very close to where you're going um, and most regional roads require some form of signal to cross uh, and the region is in charge of those sorts of things and they're in charge of the configuration of, of intersections and so I think a lot of folk uh, I'm, I'm hoping a lot of focus of, of uh, the next couple of years um, will be in coordinating or for the region will be in coordinating with cities to help unlock these uh, gaps that are created uh, by the regional road network uh, in in the active transportation network and and helping to uh, ensure continuity uh, from one level of municipality to another great thank you okay thank you chair redmond uh, thank you chair strickland my question is probably to staff it's very much along the lines of councillor mcgarry's question um your point about um off-board fair purchase is that something that we're considering when we look at um how we're dealing with uh fair purchases for the ion has it been considered for the buses mr schmidt I'm not sure if we specifically have looked at it for the the buses. With the way that we're reconfiguring the system, many of the, the main transfer points would actually be at ION stations. So that may help, but I can have staff take a look at that and see if uh, if there's anything we could do that, that would help with the, the on, on and off boarding of passengers in the buses. I can take a look at it and see. Thank you. And thanks, Mike. I was really relieved to hear your little person was in bed. I was afraid she was at a high school dance because you've been here so often. <laughs>
Okay, uh, no further questions or speakers. So thank you very much, Mike. Thanks to you and TriTag for your continued advocacy and presence here at our council meetings. Thank Always you. thoughtful comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, Emily Sofstra. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Chair Strickland, and thank you all for listening this evening. Uh, it's very important to have this public input session, and we really appreciate being able to speak. So I don't think it says on the agenda, but my name is Emily Slofster, and I'm the chair of Cycle WR. So as Mike just mentioned, that's the organization we've been working with TriTag uh, to advocate for safe cycling infrastructure across the region. So we spent the last year meeting and cycling with councillors and candidates uh, to show the importance of safe cycling infrastructure. We specifically are hoping to see infrastructure that people of all ages and abilities can use to bike safely across the region. So we were founded about one year ago because we were finding that after the LRT was constructed, there were many missed opportunities to include cycling infrastructure. So places where they redid roads, they just didn't include cycling infrastructure at all. And this was basically a missed opportunity. So we didn't want to see any more of those. We also saw some great documents from the region, such as the Act of Transportation Master Plan, but we weren't seeing any funding commitments to implement any changes. So we started to work together to bring cyclists of all ages and interests together. So those are families who are choosing cargo bikes instead of a second car, or road cyclists who can match car speeds and take over whatever lanes they need to on regional roads, or just individuals who prefer to bike for environmental, financial, health reasons, and simply because it's fun. So on a personal note, I'm a bit of a commuter cyclist, but I didn't bike tonight. I walked because it's dark, a little icy, so I'm not, you know, super hardcore when it comes to cycling, but it is a passion of mine and it's something I do enjoy and it's something I like to do with my family. On another personal note, I just finished my nursing degree in December, so as a con former Conestoga College student, I am largely in favor of the UPass, even though I'm not going to be using it. <laughs> um, so my final placement was in a local emergency department. And it was especially clear to me that people are being injured every day because of a lack of proper infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that separates vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and cyclists, from motor vehicles. So this is just some personal experience that I've had. I don't think all of these uh, collisions and incidents are properly reported anywhere. So it's just something that we are seeing. And um, not just cyclists, but pedestrians as well. So on to the budget. So at the start of the budget process, we were hopeful, as the first obvious item in the budget is that full-time equivalent for a transportation planning engineer. And Mike mentioned that as well. Uh, it's focused on active transportation, and this is an essential role that's needed within the transportation department. It's going to be a great complement to current staff and the TDM team, and we're seeing Kitchener and Waterloo, both those cities are working towards making their cities uh, more friendly for vulnerable road users. So it'll be great to have a point person at the region for engineers um, and other staff at the cities to be able to collaborate with. Now, CycleWR's campaigns around the election included cycling with candidates, which we were very grateful to be able to meet with many of you, um, or go for coffee if cycling wasn't always an option. And we also had a pledge for a minimum grid, which hopefully most of you saw. And we know that six of you signed it. So the pledge asked for a minimum grid and increased funding commitments for uh, cycling infrastructure. Now, a minimum grid, that's just a way of saying that people of all ages and abilities should be able to get across the Tri-Cities and ideally into the townships by bicycle, which requires separated protected bike lanes, not on every road, but on some of them. We suggested a minimum funding amount of $13 per resident at the regional level. So that's based on, as Mike said, uh, funding commitments that we've seen from other cities. And that's approximately $7.7 .7 million per year. When we started to go through the budget this year, we couldn't find anything close to that amount. So we were glad to see back in December that one of you requested a budget information paper about active transportation. So I want to thank now um, Councillor Galloway and Councillor Verbanovic for bringing up this, um, bringing up cycling and active transportation, uh, asking some key questions, because we're seeing that it is so important for local residents, as I already mentioned, for environmental, health, financial, recreational purposes. Uh, Councillor Councilor Galloway had a few questions that I think have already been answered or are in the process of being answered, although one of them I can answer myself, that it does take several hours to go through the budget and find all the active transportation items. It's a very large document. Uh, I can, if staff doesn't have that already, I can give them what we have because we've started to compile that information ourselves. Uh, couldn't find that much though, so maybe we're missing some things. I know at Waterloo and Kitchener, they have other papers. They have specific documents that highlight you know, multimodal transportation. Here's what they have for it. So it would really be great to see that at the regional level. Um, and that's one reason why having an active transportation engineer would be so important. So 
I did read that budget information paper. So on page 61 in your agenda today, there was a chart that makes it look like there's a significant amount of cycling infrastructure. It was like something like 700 and something kilometers. But in terms of what we're looking for, separated protected infrastructure, there's only about 84 kilometers, which isn't very much for my six-year-old who would love to be able to bike anywhere in the city, and my four-year-old who's just figuring out the cycling thing. We'd love to see much more than that 84 kilometers to be able to get anywhere we want to by bike. I'd also like to point out that those 84 kilometers, they're separated but not protected, or they're multimodal trails that maybe end at a regional road with no safe crossing. Or you come to an intersection that's four lanes and you, know, you have to go and press a button to be able to cross the road. You don't know if you're supposed to be on the road or on the sidewalk or if the sidewalk is a multi-use like, multi trail. There's a lot of issues that come with those 84 kilometers of better cycling infrastructure. Also on page 61, I'm not sure about some of the funding commitments that are listed there. So in the actual budget, I found that the protected uh, bike pilot, it was listed as one point, I think four million, but it said that that one million was subsidized. So that would be interesting to figure out because in the budget it said one million is subsidized and 387,000 are from development charges. Whereas in this budget information paper, it says that all that information is from development charges. So that's just a clarification that maybe we could get from staff. It might just be an error or maybe there's some other funding coming from elsewhere. Uh, that's something we would like to see. Uh, also, we, were only, we only saw that it's just 50 million over 10 years, rather than having it broken down into individual components, which is another thing we'd like to see. So within the budget, um, like in the main budget paper, it says that the Transportation Department states that a key priority is implementing the Regional Transportation Master Plan and the Active Transportation Master Plan, Walk Cycle Waterloo Region. So the ATMP stated that 141 million would be needed over 10 years to implement um, the walking and cycling networks, including a fix-it list and strategic signage. So we're saying now that 50 million is okay, but when the ATMP was passed, it was 141 million. So which amount is it? What do we need to actually implement a safe, protected infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians? I'd also love to see more information from regional staff about how aqua transportation funding is spent. Um, there's a budget item called cycling and pedestrian countermeasures. It's never fully spent. What is that item? What does it mean? How can we make good use of it? Another item, define and measure health benefits of active transportation and public transit. Uh, those are the sorts of things we'd like to see in a budget information paper. So we know that 60% of regional water residents are interested but concerned when it comes to cycling. We know that active transportation, the prioritization of vulnerable road users, the health of residents, these are consistently stated as priorities of the region, yet little is being done to prioritize these. In Kitchener and Waterloo, we're seeing budget items for implementation of their cycling and active transportation plans. Where are these budget items at the region? The time to act is now. Cycling infrastructure seems like a large initial investment, although large is relative, considering it's nowhere near a $118 million transit facility or a $160 million police budget. You know, $10 million over five years really isn't that much. And it also requires less maintenance over time. You build some really nice bike trails. I know the Spurline Trail, it has a little bit of maintenance, but once you build it, it's good for a long time. So it's possible we missed some projects in the budget. It's a very large document, as I already said. Um, so beyond just seeing a proper breakdown of cycling-related projects, we'd love to see increased funding. We'd love to see more budget items related to implementing this minimum grid, maybe updating the active transportation master plan, maybe extending the pilot project in Waterloo to encompass more of the region. There's a lot of things that could be done to make it better and safer for vulnerable road users in Waterloo region. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Emily. We have uh, no no questions or, or speakers, so thanks very much for your thoughtful comments. And and um, next year, when the 2020 budget comes out, just send us an email. We'll give you a summary of how much money is in there for active transportation. Unless, of course, you like going through those budget documents and trying to piece it all together. It takes a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> it does. So thanks so much for your diligence and the good work that you're doing. So thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. Okay, uh, Avi Peters, Communitech. Welcome, Avi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you all, uh, councillors, for uh, having 
me come to speak to you briefly this evening. Uh, I don't have a formal presentation. You do have some materials um, as part of the budget issue paper in your packages around uh, economic development initiatives. So the, the uh, subject I'd like to speak to you about this evening is our True North uh, conference that's coming up uh, in June of this year. And I thought it might be helpful uh, for me to provide just a little bit of context as to uh, what this True North event is about, why we've decided uh, to do it. We held the first uh, event last year. Uh, it was a bit of a grand experiment for us. So many of you may have um, participated in or been familiar with our former tech leadership conference, which was a one-day event we used to do every spring. Uh, very successful, brought about uh, 750 people out for a day-long event uh, to talk about leadership issues around technology. Uh, but they came for one day and then they went home. What we realized is that we were missing an enormous opportunity to bring a substantial number of visitors to the region to stay, to uh, participate in a business event, certainly, but also to get to know the kind of community that we are, to uh, eat in our restaurants, to stay in our hotels, to get to know uh, the culture of this place as well. And so that's part of why we have made the move, the shift to uh, the True North um, event. It's uh, one of our ways of trying to uh, add to the profile of Waterloo Region as a significant global technology uh, ecosystem. So last year, the grand experiment, uh, we think, uh, did fairly well by the success measures we set for ourselves. We brought 2,200 people uh, to the conference. Uh, they came from 15 different countries. We had a number of international speakers. We had 51 different partners, yourselves among them, so thank you very much for the support of the region last year to help us put on the event. One of the, th the things that, um, that uh, we were really excited to add to the conference itself was the, the set of festival events. So this is a series of uh, uh, concerts and arts and um, exhibits and uh, community events that weren't tied necessarily directly to the conference. They weren't open only to conference attendees. They were really a way to bring the conference attendees into the community and invite the community out to, uh, to uh, explore all the things that we have to offer. So uh, one of the things that um, we found last year was as soon as word started to spread through uh, the business community, restaurant owners and shop owners, they all put up their hand, uh, jumped on board to say, we're really interested in this. We'll, you know, we'll put up a poster in the window. We'll welcome visitors to uh, our community with uh, special events or concerts or discounts, those kinds of things. So it was really, a, it really was a team effort. Um, and so this really is how we're hoping to move forward uh, in partnership with you again this year. So we've been working with the economic development team to identify those pieces of our uh, conference budget and festival budget event uh, where we might be able to work in partnership. Transportation around the region is a sizable piece of, uh, of help that we need. Bringing 2,200 people all together, uh, we think Lot 42 is perhaps the only place we can actually physically do that, but it means they're staying at hotels throughout the region, they're dining throughout the region, and we need to make sure that they can get around and they can get to the series of events. So we've had good conversations about our transportation costs, the busing costs that uh, we will need some help with in order to move people around the region. And the last thing I'll mention is uh, through another element of our, our partnership discussions, we know that Waterloo Region, the Smart Waterloo Region Initiative, uh, we've been shortlisted for this uh, federal competition. We're really excited about this. Uh, and no matter what the result in March of the competition, the work and the effort and the tremendous amount of uh, partnership that's gone into building up uh, the activities around Smart Water the Region, we would like to showcase all of that good work at True North itself. So last year we held some discussions as a shoulder event uh, just in advance of the conference and this year the conversation that we're having with, uh, with Rod Regeer and, and the team around Smart Water the Region is how do we showcase the discussion, uh, especially because our conference theme is not just tech for tech's sake, uh, the opportunity really is to highlight technology 
that can solve big problems, technology that can create good for people in the community, uh, it's a great fit with the Smart Water region as well. So just wanted to provide that little bit of context. Happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, Abby. I just wanted to, uh, before we get to the speakers, um, the request is $80,000 one time. Is True North planning to continue beyond 2019? We are. So what we've been working at is how to identify uh, ways that we can uh, minimize the hard costs. Um, we've been in good discussions about potential for in-kind support of the cost this year. Our original thinking when we started to map out the vision for the True North Festival in particular uh, was that we would build the festival events up and down the ION infrastructure. We're not quite there yet, as we know. We're all waiting. Um, we're excited for it, but we're still in, in the position of one more year needing help with this busing uh, activity. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. Councilor Rubanovic. Well, thanks, and thanks for coming uh, in, Avi, and for uh, the great work that Communitech's doing, but the great work you guys did on, on this last year. And uh, do we have any sense in terms of what the impact of the conference last year was in terms of helping grow our our region's brand um, from a tech and innovation perspective. I, I know anecdotally, I mean, I've had a lot of people sort of reference this notion of tech for good. Um, and so that really seems to have resonated. Um, but, but have we been able to quantify that at all? Uh, yes, and we're hoping to do a better job quantifying it this year, but the things that did um, did uh, emerge for us last year, the number of international visitors we were able to draw to the conference, uh, where our previous tech leadership conference really was, you know, the catchment area was southwestern Ontario. We had visitors from across Canada, and we had visitors from uh, 15 different countries. So that was one piece. The other piece, on the days of the conference itself, we actually were the top trend on the top hashtag on, on Twitter, Canada, uh, for two days running based on what we were seeing. We did get some international media attention. And the thing that, um, that makes this uh, a really um, significant activity for us as Communitech is, you know, our job is to help technology companies in this region be successful. The things that they typically need our help with are uh, access to talent, access to capital, and access to customers and markets. We saw uh, both the conference itself and the festival as an opportunity to bring talent to meet with companies that they might not otherwise have encountered. And on the investment side, we actually had an investor collision day as one of our uh, conference events. We had close to 100 um, uh, investors not from this area come to meet one-on-one -on -one with companies. So we curated uh, about 150 one-on-one -on -one company meetings with investors over the course of the conference itself. There's a, a big tech conference coming, I think, just prior to this. There is, collision. Uh, the collision in Toronto. Are we looking to see how we may be able to collaborate and hopefully um, sort of help each other benefit from the connection there? Yeah, we've had good conversations with them. We actually shifted our timing a little later in the season so as not to run right over one another and so that uh, people would have the opportunity to attend both. The collision model is slightly different. It's much more of a, it's a collision in, in Toronto. Uh, it's hosted by the same folks who host the Web Summit, I think, uh, yeah. events around the world. And it's very much a dispersed model. So, um, you know, 50 to 100 venues, smaller conversations, some big speakers as well. Uh, so people sort of build their own schedule and disperse uh, primarily and then choose which uh, social events they'll attend at night. Our model is different in that we want those 2,000 people to be uh, together, to uh, have those chance conversations and, and make those connections while they're uh, working during the day and then disperse for the, the social activities in the evening. But we've, we've got a cross-promotional um, ag agreement with them so that uh, we can make sure that you know, people that are interested in doing both are able to do so. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we are running a little late. We have a council meeting uh, that was scheduled to start at seven. So I'm gonna say one final speaker, uh, Councillor Jaworski. Thank you, through the chair. A uh, quick one. Well, when uh, Tova and Paul were up here, I mentioned about Evolve Green grand opening, and everybody on council is going to go to that. But if I recall, there was a great uh, post-festival um, video. 
clip, yes. like about two minutes long with the opening ceremonies and that. It, could you share that with me or share it around to we'll all do. of us? Yeah. I will. It's a, it's a one minute kind of video, excitement video. It's on the True North Waterloo.ca uh, website, ah, but okay. I will circulate it so that you can uh, you can have a look. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Avi. Appreciate that. We'll let you know February 19th when we have our final budget deliberations. Okay. Great. Thanks. So this is, um, that was the final delegation, but it is a public meeting. So I have a duty to request or ask if there are any other people in the audience who'd like to speak to our 2019 operating capital budget. Calling once. Call one more time. Okay, seeing no one else who wants to speak on our budget, we'll go on with the agenda, communications, any items of other business? All right, motion to adjourn. Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Lorenz, all those in favor? That's carried. We'll move into our council meeting in a few minutes. Thank you.